his head, ten, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. Now I love this. Notice it's a composite beast. It's a leopard. It was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. You see that? You got Greece, you got Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's, and you've got Medo Persia. Is that clear? Yes. Notice too that the leopard is used in Scripture because Jeremiah, I believe it is, says that can a what? Leopard changes spots. Leopard his spots. And change his spots. That's right. Leopard doesn't change his spots. And the progressivism that is raping this country right now is traceable back, not through the papacy per se, but back to Greece. The leopard beast. There's a lot of good that came out of Greece, but there's a lot of bad too. I believe it was uh, S.N. Haskell, and his name is in the bibliography. Haskell, I believe it's in his book... Uh, Daniel, Daniel the prophet, where he says that two things came out of Alexandria, Egypt. Alexandria, of course, was established by Alexander the Great, who was from where? Greece. Greece. He said two things you need to keep aware of that came out of Greece, Alexandria specifically. He said, the spirit of the papacy and higher criticism. Higher criticism is where the human mind trumps the Word of God. The Word of God is supposed to function with our reason, but it's supposed to stay over our reason, not underneath it. And that's a point that this rabbi that I read just a few paragraphs was made in his paper was he said that the, the sages say that when wisdom proceeds, or when God proceeds, uh, man's knowledge or man's thoughts he says that wisdom can survive but when man's wisdom proceeds or stays ahead of God's revelation he says that wisdom doesn't last Amen. just a couple more thoughts from 13 here as I'll try to find how I can pare this down Oh, I knew where I was going. Hang on. Okay, we got through this. We, we kind of skipped over the first piece a little bit. We know who that was. You know, he ruled for 1,260 years, and then he was, as I mentioned earlier, he was taken down by General Berthier from, as he was sent over there by Napoleon. And now note this. When he took when that deadly wound was administered, that is the beginning of the time of the end. Amen. Are we clear on that? Yes. Okay, good. Now notice verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. The first one came out of the sea. We know of that prophecy. Sea, peoples, earth, uninhabited. And he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a bread. If you don't remember anything else, use what I'm going to say right here, hopefully, as a springboard for some study. And we say, and he spoke like a dragon. It's two lamb like horns. It didn't say it was a lamb like beast, it said it was, had two lamb like horns. Mm -hmm. Then he spoke like a dragon. That goes back to what I was saying earlier. We're looking for the big bad wolf, the mark, the mark, the mark, the Sunday law. Da, 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 da. Yes, it's going to happen. But somehow we've forgotten that all of a sudden the dragon doesn't the this beast known as America or the West, specifically America, doesn't start talking like a beast overnight. It's a gradual. It's a gradual thing. When America began to take down those two lamb-like horns, that's when he began to move to become a dragon, mm -hmm. to speak like a dragon. Right. 
that is, in my humble opinion, easily traceable over the last 130 years. Step by step by step by step. Let me give you one big example. A, a president that I was taught to really appreciate as a young man, even as a history minor at Southwestern and King. That was Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson was president of Princeton University before he was president of the United States. He was trained at Johns Hopkins, which was America's first German university, where the human mind, higher criticism, had gripped the university much like it was gripping theology of the day. Ellen White, you, you, you Google up Ellen White talking about higher criticism. She didn't have anything nice to say about it. You look at what the Bible says about it, it doesn't have anything nice to say about it either. Woodrow Wilson <coughs> coined, said something I'm, that just, just, dro just dropped into my mind like a ton of bricks. He said, America was founded on Newtonian principles. Sir Isaac Newton. What does that mean? He knew exactly what it means because our founders knew what it meant. It means this country was founded on principles that were centered around God. But he said we must, he said that was fine for the 18th century, but we're in the 20th century now. We're enlightened. We're making great progress. We've experienced the industrial age that's moving everything forward. He said, we must move America from Newtonian principles to Darwinian principles. So when you hear a person, a politician, I'll use the word, call themselves a progressive, that's what you're hearing. You're hearing Darwinism on steroids. <laughs> Because the biggest difference, the biggest difference between the Darwinian principle and the Newtonian principles, I believe, this is Dale Martin's opinion, and I think it's strongly based in, in reality, is that, that the founders, they had some struggles with this. They weren't perfect, my goodness. Yeah, Jefferson had slaves, but Jefferson also says that if God had to choose between those who supported slavery and those who didn't. He says, those who did not support slavery, they're going to win. 30 years, he said that 40 years before the Civil War. And he was right. But anyway, I digress. The, those who wanted America to follow more like the principles of Europe and not the principles of God, God-centeredness or Newtonian. They did not believe that human nature could be trusted. As James Madison wrote, men are not angels. He does need government, but then government needs... Government's not angels either. That's why we are set up... We were originally set up with the most profound insightful principles ever given. Now what do the progressives, what the progressive believe, they believe in the perfectibility of human nature. If we can just get enough social justice, if we can just get enough this and that and get you to think right and you to say the right thing, we can have a utopia right here on, in, in the world. And one of the most fascinating things in the last 15 or 20 years, maybe more closer to 30, is where, I'm going to use the word, Marxism has moved from class warfare to race warfare. Because they don't care how they do it as long as they can flip God-centeredness on its head and let man-centeredness have full sway. Dale, I noticed your term, or the title of your sermon, is called The Predictable Surprise. 
I actually borrowed that from a book that's on our shelf at home that was written by a good friend of a good friend of ours, Paul Robertson, is the good friend. Paul is dying of ALS as I stand here. Those of you know, ALS is one of the worst ways you can pass. But his mind and his faith is still good. Amen. But his friend is Sylvester Schreiber. Sylvester Schreiber is probably the eminent authority in the United States on the retirement system. Specifically Social Security, but yet he understands private pensions too. If you're, if you're working, if you and I have confidence that our 401k or our Social Security is going to be there, <coughs> as the old saying used to go, you're whistling Dixie. That's the name of his book. The, he wrote it in 2012, The Predictable Surprise. It's going to surprise people, but it's predictable. So it is with the second coming of Jesus. Boy, is it even at the door. Even at the door. Mm, mm, mm. Let's see. I just saw the clock. I apologize. <laughs> Revelation 13. i got to go back there. Revelation 13. Verse 11 again, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and spoke like a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence, and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. What I'm basically trying to say this morning is that the government is going to be World government is being transformed into tyranny. And it's on the back of tyranny that the woman is going to ride. Yes. Does that make sense? Amen. Yes. Yes. Tyranny doesn't care if it's on the right or the left. Tyranny is traceable right back to the fall in heaven. Amen. That's right. And I'm going to say this again. Those who are still riding there, oh, watch out for the mark. Keep your eye on the room while they're, while they're saying, calling for peace and safety all around us. I ask you, I have a question for you. Do you really think Satan is that stupid to run the same play continually? Same results, yes. But do you think he's, oh, Adventists, just keep your eyes on Rome. I say that's really short-sighted. It's not even supported in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. Because Paul wouldn't have written what he wrote in 1 Thessalonians if it were. All you have to do is sit back and keep your eye on the mark. It's going to be too late, brothers and sisters. Yes, the image to the beast is almost done. It was almost done in Jones' day 130 years ago. He was talking about that, wasn't he? That's right. But here's the difference, and here's what makes it so subtle. Rain and I talked about this a lot, and I am going to try to figure out how to close this. Maybe you'll, I'll come back. Amen. In the 1880s, I think Ron, you and I have talked about this a little bit too. In the 1880s, Satan did a direct hit on God's people, Amen. on this country. That direct hit was on one of those two horns. They're lamb-like. Now it's important to note that these two horns are symbiotic. They interrelate with each other. You attack the civil liberty horn, you're attacking religious liberty. You attack the religious liberty horn, you're attacking civil liberties. They're symbiotic. They work, they're distinct, but they work together. Satan raised, Satan raised up a man by the name of Blair, Senator Blair, 1888. He has a committee. He's ready to go. He's ready to go with the National Sunday Law. And God has A.T. Jones. If you haven't read, not Marcuson's, but Jones's National Sunday Law, you got to read it. The man 
was used of God unbelievably brilliant. He was interrupted, I believe, 350 times in an hour and a half, and he never lost his train of thought. Like Daniel of all, he describes that he could see the words on the on the wall behind, on, on the wall behind the senators what he was saying next. Praise the Lord. Amen. Talk about the miracles. Yes. Thank you, Ricky. I believe in miracles. Amen. And God used Jones to shoot that down. <clears throat> they tried all through the 19, 1890s to pass Sunday law. Nothing. Then, the 20th century rolled around. Satan changed. We're still stuck there, waiting for the big one. In, 19, in the 20th century, Satan flipped the script and started attacking the civil horn. He started attacking the civil horn, primarily through progressivism. And that's what we're experiencing right now. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's not rocket science. If you're awake, it's happening right now. Yes, those two magnificent lamb-like horns, religious and civil liberty, said another way, Protestantism and Republicanism. That's lowercase r. It's not the party. Forget that. Mm -hmm. By the way, I'm a registered independent. Republicanism means representative, limited government. Yes. Not centralized, big government. Remove those two horns and the image to the beast is complete. There's no more breaks. There's no more breaks. Yes, the God-ordained principles instituted in the founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, which some call the civil religion of America, that's as far as I'll go. And the Constitution removed those. Ellen White said what happened, that this country would re eventually repudiate every principle of this Constitution. And when that happens, then it speaks like a dragon. It's already whispering, but it's going to shout. And my prayer is that we will not be caught off guard. Brothers and sisters, I have been wrestling with doing the sermon for some time. I still haven't done it. But I think I need to say it. Like I said, I never, may never see you guys again. Another thing this church needs to study is Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13, which a lot of people interpret that whatever Washington says, we're, as long as it's not the Sunday law, then we're supposed to bow. That's not what Revelation, what Romans 13 is talking about. In fact, it was the correct understanding of Romans 13 that laid the groundwork for the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. Read one sermon by Jonathan Mayhew, a Congregationalist pastor in Massachusetts. Kind of based somewhat on what Franklin, Ben Franklin said, is repeated by Thomas Jefferson that resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. Ooh, that sounds controversial, but it's not. Jonathan Mayhew, John Adams, the great John Adams, I call him the great John Adams because he was the first president that really railed against slavery. John Adams says that every single person in Massachusetts either heard or read that sermon by Jonathan Mayhew. Look it up. It's only a few bucks on Amazon. It's a great sermon. Great, great, great sermon. Yes, as I close, as I try to figure out how to close, I'm going to begin to wrap this up by summarizing the kind of thinking that, in my humble opinion, has wrought havoc on the lamb-like horn. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to list a few of the issues that we're facing right now that is wreaking havoc on the two lamb-like horns of Revelation chapter 13. 
Number one, and these are not necessarily in order, and then we're going to look at our bibliography. <laughs> Number one is the administrative state, the bureaucracy primarily of Washington. In fact, I have a friend, never met him, we've emailed a number of times. He's a scholar at Johns Hopkins. He said, he wrote, he said the administrative state in America is the greatest threat to religion. He's a Catholic. He said it's the greatest threat to religious liberty in America right now is the administrative state, the bureaucracy. Some call it the deep state, others may call it the swamp. It's unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats that have legislative, executive, and judicial power. They create their own laws, they execute their own laws, they adjudicate their own laws. Does that sound like America? No. Sounds like tyranny to me. It's a threat to religious liberty like you can't imagine. Anybody, anyone, regardless of a party affiliation who tries to control it will be taken out and taken down. Number two, again, these are not in order. I'll put that one, I just said it, number one. Open borders destroy sovereignty and the principles of our founding. Boy, Dale, you're sounding political. Well, I say wake up. I'm talking about principles here. I'm not talking about politics in the partisan sense. By the way, did you know the word politics comes from the word polis in the Greek, which means city and how it works? Yep. I'm a political guy. I care about how my city works. Do you? Not partisanly, but principle. <clears throat> Number three, globalism and transnationalism plays right into one world following the beast. Transnationalism. No borders. We're all big citizens of the world. Hmm. And this is a big one because we've got some scientists here. Issuing godlike powers to science. If you look at the definition of godlike powers to science, it's called scientism. Not science, scientism. Stacy and I were at a, at a conference in Washington two years ago. And one of the speakers said this, I've never forgotten this, I wrote it down. He said, when the rule of law, the rule of law goes, then we see what we're seeing now ruled by politics. And he says the natural progression, progression historically from rule of law to rule by politics, the third third step is always ruled by force. Is that Revelation 13 or what? And that's why the vast majority of the world is going to get the mark in the hand. Not the head. Doesn't matter. It's still the mark. <coughs> I want to close with a quote. And then I want to look briefly, briefly at the bibliography. Can I do that? Ellen wrote these words. This was in 1909. She's 81 years old. She said, we are homeward bound. It will not be long until we shall see him in whom our hopes of eternal life are centered. And in his presence, all the trials and sufferings of this life will be as nothingness. If you think this has been a negative message this morning, I ain't negative. I'm positive that Jesus is coming. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. i got to say one. I have this quote. I have to back up and throw this one on you. This is from Great Controversy, page 573. Remember what I said about science a few minutes ago? That when science becomes the God, when God, when science tells politics, when when science begins to make social policy, 
It becomes scientism. She said, wrote this in 1888. She says, when the false science of the present day, which undermines faith in the Bible, that's Darwinism, will prove as successful in preparing the way for the acceptance of papal of the papacy with its pleasing forms. As did. In other words, the scientist is setting up the papacy in the same way as did the withholding of knowledge in opening the way of its aggrandizement in the Dark Ages. In other words, <coughs> in other words, the Dark Ages focused on ignorance. Keep people ignorant. Don't let them have the Bible. Remember, Luther even had to find a Bible on the chain to the wall of the monastery. Keep people in ignorance. She says, what's going on today? And she was specifically referring to Darwinism, I believe. Progressivism will be just as successful. So you trust, just like Hegel said. You need to know who Hegel was. You got to need to know who Hegel was. Hegel was the godfather of today's pro progressivism. And, and Darwin and Karl Marx both adored him. He said, the state is the march of God in the earth. We are homeward bound. It will not be long. And I would be remiss if I did not say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen. Quickly, I'm sorry, I'm 20 minutes over. Where are you here? I want you to briefly look at the bibliography. I'll take three minutes. Number one is the books of Daniel and Revelation. As it relates to what I've been saying, actually I should have put a third book in there. No revival in the, over the last five years has ever occurred without a deep understanding of the book of Romans, the letter to Romans. Christ our righteousness. Maybe Ron will talk about that this afternoon. It's helpful to be aware that when you're studying this, Daniel focuses on kingdoms and nations, whereas Revelation has more emphasis on religion for it. Not that there's, there's overlap, of course. And if you haven't read these two books by Haskell, they were crucial to us in our study, Daniel the prophet and the seer of Matt Patmos. <clears throat> he wrote these at the turn of the 20th century. That's why you begin to see little... Oh, if you're studying what's going on in America, in the world, in the turn of the 20th century, you see what had. Oh, Haskell's referring to that. It's really good. And of course, the conflict of the ages, particularly the great controversy, which it's amazing. Now, a lot of people don't realize that the great controversy, which is the fifth volume, was actually written first. Very insightful. And then, as I mentioned, the National Sunday Law by Jones. It's must. Read on framing the defense of the Sabbath, the rights of the people, which I love, by A.T. Jones. He presents a model for understanding and defending the biblical principles of the American family. It's not political, brothers and sisters, in the partisan sense. It's principles. And then number six, Raymond is the one who brought this to our attention. I'd heard of this guy. Because my daddy had mentioned him, and I, as I told you, my daddy died 60 years ago. But time of the end, by, by George McCready Price. Buffy did this cover. Amen. Amen. And Raymond chased me to this book, and I've read it four times. Stacy reformatted it, it's a lot easier to read than the old smaller volume. Stacy reformatted it, and it's on Amazon now for a slice, price of a slice of, of uh, cholesterol clogging pizza. <laughs> and, and Bucky has uh, CDs of that Raymond. Oh, yeah. Raymond narrated this on CDs. If, if anybody, we, we've supplied this to whole, offered to supply this to whole churches. It's a must, must read. And what, okay, what's it about, Dale? 
All my life until I read this book, I've been a little confused on Revelation chapter 17 because I've had different interpretations that have come across my purview. This is the only one that makes sense. This is the only one that makes sense. In Revelation 17. But it's hard to get people to read. It's not a hard read. It's not a hard read at all. And it's great. Great, 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 great. And what... Um, the precursor.